Hi, today we're going to be pitching DoorDash, um, our recommendation in the cell. Um, before we go ahead and get started, we just want to introduce ourselves. I'm Lauren Polo. I'm Mark Buckwalter. I'm Adam Hazlett. And I'm Watson Lloyd. Our target price that we value Dash at is 10508. The last close was 149.46, and this represents a 29.7% downside. A little bit about Dash is that they're an app based food delivery service. They partner with local and chain merchants in your area. They primarily operate in the United States and they are a gig based employer. So they contract out all their dashers who are the delivery drivers. So if they work up to 40 plus hours a week, they still don't reap full time employee benefits. This is a high level overview of the management and board of directors team. Um, the found these four make up 79% of the voting rights in the dash stock. And here is a graphic of the share price performance graph. Um, Dash IPO'd in December of 2020. And um, this is just a comparison of them compared to the New York Stock Exchange and the close competitor Grubhub. So here's a just quick breakdown of business operations. As you can see, there are three main operating segments, Drive, the Marketplace, and Dash Storefront. The most supportive of those three is the Marketplace. That's where the food ordering and delivery takes place. Uh, we want to highlight the income statement and um, under total revenue, we want to note that uh, revenue is recognized net of any cost paid out towards the dashers. Uh, because they're not employees or contractors, the revenue um, reflects having that fees, having those fees already taken out. Uh, we also want to highlight the key performance metrics. Um, the first one to note is the sales and growth. Um, as you can see, growth has been very large, over 200% per year for the past two years. Uh, but despite this large amount of growth, they've been unable to generate a positive free cash flow. The industry has seen massive growth due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, people were forced to stay at home and order food in versus going out to restaurants. This industry is highly competitive. There are lots of players in there. And um, it's also very hard to gain a competitive advantage as well. Uh, because these are all relatively the same service provided, they all involve ordering food and have it delivered. It's really hard to kind of separate yourself from the market. Uh, this industry has had many recent acquisitions uh, where Justy Takeaway acquired Grubhub, Uber Eats acquired Postmates, and DoorDash acquired Caviar. So this is going to create a few very large uh, players in the industry. They're going to have a very large market share. Uh, this industry is also in a prime position to see a sudden drop in sales now that COVID restrictions are being lifted and people can go back to eating in restaurants again versus having food only delivered. In order to get a better understanding of Dash, we wanted to um, conduct some primary research. So we spoke with both Dashers and local merchants in the Manhattan, Kansas area. Um, overall, very quickly, we found that Dashers felt they were being inadequately compensated for their time and effort. Um, the merchant partners all relatively felt that Dash was underperforming in their professional relationships that they have built so far. And we see these both being a significant risk for Dash um, going forward in order to maintain and continue to grow their market share. Yeah, so we noticed some of the common complaints we heard from our prior research on this slide here. Uh, for restaurants, one of the big complaints was late drivers, where the restaurant would have the food ready to say one o'clock, uh, but the drivers wouldn't show up till one or one, uh, till 1.30 or two o'clock. And by the time the drivers came, the food was cold and mushy enough, the standards that the restaurants held themselves to. So the restaurants were then forced to go ahead and remake the food out of their own um, pocket, which really hurt their profitability. Restaurants also complained about orders not getting picked up. Uh, so the way this platform works is that a customer goes that they order food through the app, the restaurant receives it, starts making the food. And then after all that has happened, then DoorDash starts trying to find a driver to pick up the food. Uh, it is very common late at night or right when a restaurant's getting close to closing that no driver ever decides to pick up the dash and go get the food. So these restaurants are now left with food they had to go ahead and make. Customers are flipping into the thing. It just hurts the profitability and the brand of the restaurants. And then finally, the biggest complaint we heard from every single restaurant was a lack of accountability from DoorDash. Every single restaurant said they were having problems with the system. And every time they tried to talk to DoorDash about problems with drivers or the app itself, nobody from the company could be found to um, hear their comments or their concerns. So they just really felt like they were underappreciated uh, by the company. The drivers complained a lot about unfair compensation. Uh, they complained about having to drive long distances, and they also complained about a type of order, which was grocery store pickup. Uh, these orders involved where the customers order food from like Walmart, Hy-Vee, uh, the dashers go ahead and do a complete grocery order, and then often when they were done with these deliveries, they got little to no tip. The media has also started to pick up on some of the things that we noticed. So you can see the bottom left-hand corner, a DoorDash driver was caught dropping a pizza, putting it back in the box, uh, bad food quality. The DoorDashers are trying to game the algorithm to increase their pay. So essentially, the primary research we found noted a lot of cracks in the foundation that is DoorDash, and the media is starting to report on it uh, through things like this. And ultimately, this is going to hurt the shareholder value. And as people keep hearing these negative stories, more articles are going to come out, like the one you can see on the left there that says DoorDash shares are still trading too high, and it's going to hurt the uh, long-term profitability of the company.
So here we've highlighted four performance drivers that we feel will inhibit Dash's ability to provide long-term value to shareholders. One thing not mentioned is the fact that Dash is potentially facing an increasing cost structure due to some regulatory headwinds that are taking place. So because Dash is a gig-based employer, uh, a lot of governments are starting to require these employers to start incorporating their employees as actual full-time employees and pay them a minimum wage and other full-time benefits such as healthcare costs, if you will. In addition to that, uh, as outlined from our primary research, we see that the failing merchant relationships is a huge risk to Dash going forward, as well as their inadequate uh, Dash or compensation. So overall, we feel that all of these things will collectively be a negative aspect to shareholders. Here's the flywheel, as Dash calls it. We've outlined it as their organic growth strategy, which essentially says that in order for Dash to be successful, they must continue to have good relationships with their current merchant partners, and then also add new merchant partners going forward. In addition to that, they must also have good relationships with their drivers and add more drivers to the platform. What we found from our primary research is that Dash struggles significantly on both of these aspects, and it's something that we see as a huge issue for uh, DoorDash going forward. This is a graphical representation of how we perceive Dash's risks. We've listed this out based off of level of impact and the probability of it taking place. As mentioned before, regulatory headwinds and the effects of their poor merchant relationships are two of the primary and most impactful risks that we see. And here's the brief ratio analysis with the peer group that we've used and DoorDash. <clears throat> it's worth mentioning that Grubhub and Lyft is going to be acquired by Just Eat Takeaway. The deal just hasn't closed yet. So although you can see DoorDash's gross margin is slightly higher than their peers, they still have a negative EBITDA margin and the return on capital return on assets is lower than their peer group averages. And as you can see here, DoorDash continues to struggle with their EBITDA margin and despite the 400% growth that they've had in sales the past two years, they just can't push that top line growth to the bottom line. Here's our different valuation methods that we had used. We had used two valuation methods on intrinsic value, unlevered DCF using exit EBITDA multiple approach and terminal growth rate approach, and a relative valuation on trading comparables. We made our trading comparables slightly higher at 40% because Dash is an early stage company and they have negative and unpredictable free cash flows. In addition, we split our unlevered DCF between those two different approaches because of the uncertain economic environment and just to have a more pure play between the different growth rates and, and actually even a cool. Here's a scenario analysis of our DCF. A couple aspects we want to highlight here is our exit EBITDA multiple. We used a 15.5 times for our base case. We see this is a fairly optimistic multiple that we derived from our comparable group. In addition to that, our terminal growth rate for our unlevered DCF was a 2.4% growth rate, which we also believe to be a little bit more optimistic. For our relative valuation, this chart outlines our comparable group that we selected. The two metrics we used was a one year forward EV to revenue multiple. This is because Dash has negative earnings, so we had to go with top line revenue for that metric. In addition to that, we used a last 12 months price to book metric. We would have liked to use an earnings per share method or metric, but uh, due to the fact that Dash has negative earnings, we were forced to use price to book in order to incorporate some of their cost structure into our relative valuation. Together, these two metrics gave us a blended target price for our base case of 163.44. And here you can see the different assumptions that we had used in our discounted cash flow. We had our WAC at 13.10% and our terminal growth at 2.37%. On the right there beneath our terminal growth rate, we used those weighted averages of GDP growth, inflation, US population growth, and the industry EPS growth. For our risk-free rate, we used the US 10-year treasury for equity risk premium. We use the bots and chin model to take macroeconomic factors into play, as well as a survey, survey that's more forward looking. For cost of equity, we use the capital asset pricing model, as well as the farmer French model. And for cost of debt, we had looked at their credit rating. And here's a quick overview of evaluation football field with the different ranges of the different valuation methods we use, as well as the 52 week high and low. In the center, you can see the blended target price with our full case being 148.21 at negative 1% downside from their previous close of 149.46. Our base case of 105.08 with our downside of 29.7% and our bear case was 75.21 at a 49.7% downside. It's worth mentioning that we used even more optimistic assumptions than management have laid out in the most recent press release. Once again, we just want to reiterate that we are recommending a sell of Dash. Our target price is 105.08. The last closing was 149.46 and this Im implies a 29.7% downside. Thank you all for your time today and we look forward to the live Q&A.